Um, welcome to this. Uh, I guess there's an on online conversation, right? Uh, is there, uh, like a, there's not a presentation. Hopefully, it will be a conversation. Um, titled uh, William Kentridge, a South African artist in the global gaze. And I think um, I'm obviously I'm joined by um, Dr. Al Alistair Meredith um, of Strauss Auction House. Um, um, I'm Anders Pettersson, the founder and managing director of Art Tactic. Um, but maybe as an introduction, uh, Alistair, why don't you maybe talk a little bit about yourself, your background and your role within Strauss, and maybe also your link to the Kentridge market. And I'll talk a little bit about myself and then we can sort of, you know, branch into the, the, the broader questions uh, about his career and his market. Yeah, perfect. Well, thanks, Anders. Yeah, it's lovely to be part of this conversation. Thank you. Um, yes, my, my, my name's Alistair. I, I suppose my background is, is more academic, uh, as opposed to many of my other colleagues who come from fine art backgrounds. Um, I studied mainly in, in the UK, uh, although I focused almost entirely on South African art uh, whilst there. Um, I've been at Strauss & Company now for just over eight years um, as an art specialist. Um, I suppose for the listeners that don't know Strauss and Company, we're a, a South African based auction house. Um, we have offices and sale rooms in Johannesburg as well as in Cape Town. Um, we were, well, the company was established in 2009. Um, and I suppose during that time, we've established ourselves as the sort of leading art auction house in the country and uh, on the continent. Um, we mainly focus on South African and Pan-African art and sculpture, um, but we also do um, have sales focusing on uh, ceramics and decorative arts, uh, furniture, silver, jewellery too. So it's still a, a broad auction house and maybe most recently uh, we've opened a wine department, which has also been um, very exciting um, here in South Africa. Um, as far as my link to Cambridge is concerned, um, uh, I don't have much of a link other than the fact that I really, really love his work. You know, I think certainly here in Johannesburg, and I, I'm broadcasting from Johannesburg, we're quite possessive over William because we feel he, um, you know, he's so close to us and he is. He, he lives about uh, a mile southeast of our offices. Um, so he's kind of right on our doorstep and we're so amazingly proud that he's been able to build this uh, international renown. Um, yeah, so that's my, my little link. I suppose more recently I was lucky enough to go to the, uh, the Kentridge show at the Royal Academy in London, um, which, which, which was absolutely fantastic, um, you know, to see a major survey show, um, you know, is always wonderful. Sorry, I, you'll see our lights have just gone on and off. We, um, we have electricity problems here in South Africa, but the generator has kicked in. So we are, we are up and running. Excellent. Well, it gives special effects. That's that's brilliant. Yeah. Um, excellent. I, I just from from our background. Um, so for those of you who doesn't know who don't know our tactic, we are in London-based art market research uh, data analytics company, and we have been involved in the uh, I would say the the African market for six five six years now. We produce an annual report that looks at not only the uh, I guess both the regional uh, auction market as well as the international and the cross section between them. Um, we just launched a, a William Kentridge report in September that with uh, Alice and I will talk a little bit uh, about towards the end of the conversation today. Um, but it's basically um, generally a market, you know, Africa for us, is, it is an important part. Uh, I think was particularly interesting in the work we and the partnership with with Strauss is also to start to get a you know an insider perspective. We often see things from an international, and I think it's really interesting. Hopefully today is also to get a uh, you know a regional, but also maybe a more local South African perspective on this particular market. Um, so, Alistair, I think we maybe we'll just sort of um, launch into this. I mean, I, I, I you know we're we're dealing with an artist that you know since the nineteen eighties has been you know a very prolific in many ways. I mean, in terms of the way he works, the mediums, the type of projects. I mean. Um, we just, in our research, you know, found out that, it, you know, since the 1980s, it's done about 700 exhibitions around the world, um, you know, pre predominantly most of these in institutional museum type of spaces. So obviously, this is an artist that has, over many years, built up a very substantial career. But I think still a lot of people don't really know much about the artist. And I, th I thought maybe to start with is to, if you could give us a little bit of introduction to 
to the various aspects of, of his career and how this has evolved over time, because just to kind of give a little bit of a context to, to what we see today. Yeah, yeah, sure, with absolute pleasure. Um, I'll try and contain my enthusiasm um, as I do, uh, but I, I do have a few slides, which um, I'll share my screen uh, in a moment, just to give you a bit of an overview of, of William's career. Hold on, um, screen one share. Um, hold on. Okay. Oh, that's the wrong screen. Just give me a second. Okay. Can you, I'm, I'm hoping you can all see my screen. Um, it's William in his studio, um, yeah. just up the road, as I say, sort of a, a mile southeast of us. Um, and yes, William over a 40 year career has, has built up the most uh, staggering body of work. Um, to give you a bit of biographical background, um, I suppose I'll need to go back to the mid 70s. Let me just change the slide here. Uh, but before I do a few statistics, mainly pulled from your report, Anders, which floored me. Um, you, you mentioned that um, he his work has been part of over 700 group exhibitions, um, solo shows totaling over 260, um, which is remarkable. You know, many South African artists are delighted to have three or four solo shows over a career. So uh, to, to have 261 is absolutely staggering. Um, his work has been shown at 17 biennials, I think four times at the Venice Biennale. Um, 17 film festivals, thrice at Documenta. He's taken over 13 individual opera houses at various points. Um, and that kind of uh, sort of international momentum um, for, for a South African artist is, is frankly unheard of. Um, if I think about his literature and the huge number of books that, that, that his work has, has spawned, I think it's well over 110 individual uh, titles. Um, which again is quite remarkable. These are just a few of them um, starting from, uh, from the late 1970s. Um, those of you that know very little about his biography, um, William was born in Johannesburg in 1955. He um, attends the University of the Witwatersrand in the mid 1970s. He starts off um, in the fine art department and quickly uh, changes to um, the political science and African studies. Uh, but during this time, he is um, almost entirely focused on the theater. Um, and, and in the late 1970s, he is very involved in the nunnery theater at, at the Witz University, putting on plays, um, designing sets, costumes, uh, working through dialogue, um, choreography, and of course, as I'm showing you here, um, posters. Uh, w w which now are increasingly rare, or they do pop up uh, occasionally on auction. Um, in 1979, uh, William has his first solo exhibition, and that's at the Market Theatre, which again is, is just up the road from us here um, in Houghton. Um, the work he showed there was mainly printmaking and monotypes, um, his so-called pit series, uh, like the work I'm showing you here on the right that was recently acquired by an American institution. You know, these are works that um, play to his obvious interest in the theatre at the time, but I think are very different to what a lot of Cambridge enthusiasts would expect to see. Um, a, a very different kind of aesthetic um, that we know now. Um, in 1980, 1981, he was working on a remarkable series called The Domestic Scenes. These very small scale etchings, like, uh, like, like the few I'm showing you here, where he is I suppose gently satirizing um, the white South African bourgeoisie, um, sort of very overweight women, sort of pushing trolleys, being terrified by cats, uh, things like that, sort of warthogs with their uh, sort of bums up towards naked figures. Um, as I say, gently lampooning um, the South African white society specifically. Um, these are gorgeous little etchings and um, th they are, part of the first 
um, catalog resume that's just been published by Warren Siebritz. This is a, an image of that uh, particular book. Um, Warren Siebritz, a, a local um, art historian, is putting together the entire catalog resume of Williams printmaking at the moment, and I think that's going to take many, many years, but this is the first um, iteration of, uh, of that catalog resume. Um, in 1981, uh, William goes to Paris uh, and he actually studies mime in Paris. And between eight, 1981 and 1984, 1985, he pretty much does no traditional art making, no printmaking, no drawing. Um, he gives up uh, almost entirely. Um, as you see here, he, he gets married to Anne uh, Stanwix in 1982, a, a very prominent rheumatologist here at the Donny Gordon Hospital. Um, and he is more and more involved in theatre as well as filmmaking. Um, it's only in 1984-1985 where he returns um, to, to printmaking and to drawing specifically. Um, and you see him here, uh, a little self-portrait um, in the, or approaching the Flat Iron Building in New York with a portfolio of works under his left arm, sort of passing this open manhole and, um, and this yellow taxi cab with this warthog on the roof. And this is a, a young William trying to establish himself and his art making career internationally, first trying in New York, where, where he doesn't get too much traction uh, at this point. It's a, it's a while still um, before critics and academics and collectors start, start looking at his work. Um, but the other kind of work he starts producing in the mid 1980s uh, is a triptych like this. Uh, this is called the Conversationist's Ball, um, and it's arguably one of the most important drawings produced in South Africa in, in the 20th century. It's owned by the Rupert Foundation, usually on show at the Rupert Museum in Stellenbosch, but now for another two months or something uh, on show at the Royal Academy in London. Uh, this is a, a landmark drawing, as I say. Um, I mentioned earlier that he was sort of gently lampooning the white uh, bourgeoisie in South Africa with those domestic scenes in 1980, 1981, um, and he's not criticizing them gently anymore by 1985. Um, I think he's quite ruthlessly, uh, ruthlessly satirizing um, a, a very happy and blinkered white middle class in South Africa. These essentially are sort of white Nero's fiddling while Rome burns around them. Um, and of course, what I mean then is the social and political context of South Africa in the mid 1980s. 1985, there's a state of emergency um, proclaimed uh, in the winter of that year, uh, again in the winter of 1986, a, a 10 years after the, Weta, uh, the Soweto student uprisings, um, there is um, enormous social unrest um, and injustice uh, in South Africa, and very specifically uh, here on the High Felt in Johannesburg. And William is very much a part of that, um, and he is an enormous critic uh, of what is going on. He should be, of course, because his family was very much entrenched in the political struggle. Um, the gentleman on the right here is William's father. Uh, this is um, Sir Sidney Kentridge, who I understand actually turns 100 on Saturday, uh, which is quite amazing. But um, Sidney Kentridge, uh, one of the most important uh, apartheid era um, legal minds and attorneys. This is him with George Bezos, but most famously, he helped acquit the 159 or 161 um, uh, uh, accused at the treason trial between 1958 and 1961. Um, um, I think he's the only attorney to have um, defended three Nobel Peace Prize uh, winners, including Man uh, Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu and Albert Latuli. Uh, so William is very much part of this struggle. Um, I would also say that despite him being so hyper aware of it and so critical of it, he was in quite an awkward position because he was also part of the um, sort of more sheltered uh, uh, white society uh, that benefited from apartheid and the very society he was critiquing. So a, a very strange position uh, in, in which to be. Um, but this is another kind of work that he was producing during this context. Uh, you'll see this 
uh, burning tire above this warthog. Um, there's a hell of a lot going on here, but uh, the, the tire referencing um, this horrific form of punishment for necklacing, which was going on um, in, 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 Jah in Johannesburg at the time, um, where traitors would be um, sort of covered in these tires and let alight. Uh, you'll see wild animals, particularly ugly wild animals, scavengers, hyenas, warthogs, um, appearing um, readily in these works from the 1980s. And they, I think, are symbols of, uh, of, of authoritative figures, whether they be politicians uh, or, or, or the police state. Um, He's not obviously working in isolation. There are other artists working uh, alongside him, also fighting these ideas of censorship and police brutality and decadence and violence. Um, artists like Jane Alexander, I'm showing you her butcher boys here, as well as Penny Siopis. This is one of her famous uh, still life paintings uh, from the late 1980s. Um, William was also producing works like this uh, on the left, a work called Responsible Hedonism, and the work on the right, a very famous drawing and then etching called Caspers Full of Love, uh, where he's essentially taking a bird's eye view of these decapitated heads, these figures from the struggle um, being collected and rolling around these Caspers, which were massive armored vehicles uh, controlling the population in Johannesburg and in Pretoria at the time. These are enormously hard hitting works uh, being produced by a relatively young artist uh, in, in the mid to late 1980s. Um, in 1989, um, William uh, essentially presents his first famous animated film, um, which is a work called Johannesburg's Second Greatest City After Paris, where he introduces this horrendous figure, this rapacious industrialist called Soho Eckstein. And Soho Eckstein really symbolizes everything uh, that is bad yeah, particularly in Johannesburg, this gluttonous industrialist uh, wiping out um, uh, some elements of the city, um, using it for his own gain. Um, he also introduces uh, the, I suppose, the counterpoint to, to um, Soho Eckstein, um, a man called Felix Teitelbaum, who is the poet, the lover, um, usually portrayed in the nude like this as I say, the counterpoint uh, to feel, uh, to Soho Eckstein. These are the characters that um, would reappear uh, all the way through um, William's career, uh, all the way into his most recent film in 2020 called City Deep. In 1990, he produces another landmark film called Monument. Um, 91, uh, a work called Mine. I'm showing you an, an, Im an image here from Mine where uh, William produces this incredible visual metaphor of this fat Soho Eckstein um, propped up in bed with these pillows all around him, having been brought his morning coffee. And as he plunges the coffee, uh, uh, the coffee plunger, it sort of starts spiraling downwards through the blanket uh, all the way through into the subterranean world of Johannesburg, all the way past these um, um, murdered bodies, all the way down to the rich gold vein uh, on which Johannesburg is built. Uh, an amazing metaphor he he's able to create. I'll skip through some of these images, but these are images from some of the other important films from the time. Uh, this one's um, called Sobriety, Obesity and Growing Old. Uh, this work called Felix in Exile from 1994, a very, very famous film. And then more recently, this work, um, uh, which is called um, City Deep from 2020. And there you see a very elderly now Soho Eckstein, uh, a rather miserable and sad Soho Eckstein, uh, who is um, in the Johannesburg Art Gallery uh, of all places, the old Lutyens design building, a, a symbol of colonial, colonialism in many ways, uh, pouring over these vitrines and seeing these um, I suppose paintings and images of the past almost disappearing and crumbling um, before his eyes. Uh, that is his last or the most recent major film uh, of which he's done 11 and for which he is so uh, wi uh, widely known. Those are just some of the drawings and films. Uh, but if you think about the breadth of his career, it encompasses too many 
forms and works and projects to, to mention here. Uh, I'll just show you a few. Um, this is one of my favorite processional works uh, that was recently on show um, at, at the Zeitz Mocker Museum in Cape Town. Here's a still from the Lulu Opera, uh, the head and the, the load at the Tate Modern. Um, you see him working in sculpture, a major processional um, piece he did here. Um, and then another major, major work that he did on the banks of the Tiber in Rome, um, a work called Triumphs and Laments in 2016, where he devised and designed a mural um, that took up about 550 meters of the embankment um, and against which he performed these uh, incredible operatic moments with these moving parts and moving figures and shadow play, um, a, a, a work that he essentially water blasted out of the century old grime and dirt that had collected sort of on this very, very famous um, embankment. I think Kate has seen it recently. Uh, she says there are a few remnants left, but generally it's disappeared, which which, which, which what it was meant to have done. Um, and you mentioned earlier, Anders, that, um, you know, in the question, how, how has he developed on, on an international scale? Why is he uh, internationally known? Uh, I think that's because of works like this. You know, no Roman, no Italian uh, will not know who William Kentridge is uh, when you think of works like this. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, uh, this is his refusal of time that went on show at the um, the Metropolitan recently. I've mentioned uh, the Royal Academy in London, you know, one of the prime gallery viewing spots in London, now taken over by, by William's work. Um, ultimately, he, he, he is a famous figure. Um, and to finally put that in context, I suppose, uh, at the middle of this year, he picked up an honorary degree from Columbia University alongside some of these people, you know, Hillary Clinton, Yo-Yo Ma, Patti Smith, uh, and William Kentridge. You know, he's, um, he's always in very, very good company. Amazing. Um, Alistair, that was an, uh, a fantastic, um, well, fantastic introduction to such as we've talked about, such an in incredible, diverse and long career. Um, I think you're just getting that visual aspect and see how his, how his work has moved from the 1980s. Um, you know, he's very politically charged work, but still obviously had that, that undertone uh, in today's work. Um, I just wanted to kind of maybe talk a little bit about as as from a collecting perspective. So now we have seen a kind of the breadth, I guess, of uh, both in terms of mediums and works from drawings to animations, et cetera. But how would you, if you were thinking from someone who's entering this market for the first time, I mean, how would you classify, you know, where do we, what are the entry points? You know, what is the, you know, from, from maybe the more affordable range all the way up and maybe attach some kind of sense of importance to, within these segments, you know, where, where what, what does one look for? You know, that's just to kind of give us sort of a sense of a connoisseurship approach to, to yeah. his market. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in, in, in terms of collecting, William offers the most incredible opportunity because you can enter the market at so many price points. So yes, you can spend a million dollars on a major drawing or film or processional bronze piece. Um, but similarly, you can buy a high edition signed poster um, for certainly in, in South African terms, um, what, 5,000 Rand, which, which comes to the grand total of about 250 US dollars, maybe 300 US dollars. Mm. Um, and I would say on that point, international collectors certainly have it in their favor with the ever weakening mm. South African Rand. Um, but the entrance, the entry points uh, can be very, very low. Of course, if you're buying a high edition poster, you can't expect something like that to appreciate enormously in value over time. You would need to be, be looking at slightly meatier works. Um, but again, there's enormous range. He is a master printmaker. He has been printing, as I've said, since 1979. Um, so he has produced an enormous body of multiples um, across uh, all the years he's been working. They are different in scale uh, and, and importance and obviously in price. Um, the smaller works uh, typically sell for about 30 or 40,000 Rand. So you're looking at about 2,000 pounds, two and a half thousand US dollars. So again, very, very modest uh, prices. 
Um, in terms of the major drawings, though, um, drawings from the films uh, I showed you a little bit earlier, then, yes, you're looking at the hundreds of thousands of US dollars or, or hundreds of thousands of pounds. In South African terms, you're starting at about three, four, five million rand, um, depending on the kind of work you're looking at. Um, you know, I think connoisseurs or, or, or very um, knowledgeable Kentridge buyers are always going to look at periods of his career that are maybe more weighty, more important. You know, I showed you some of those drawings from the mid 1980s. You know, those kind of drawings are increasingly rare. Um, and, and if a major work from that kind of period comes onto the market, um, as it does do occasionally, we had two in our, in our May auction this year. Um, you know, we always um, realize that there's strong competition for those works. Um, for collectors, it's also worth bearing in mind uh, that for those kind of works, the competition is not always from other collectors. Uh, it, 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 in most cases, it's from institutions. Mm. Um, you know, many of the works we've certainly handled of that kind of caliber have gone to U.S. institutions or, or institutions in Australia and, and across Europe um, for a number of reasons. Uh, the, the main reason being that Kentridge um, suffered from the cultural boycotts uh, um, imposed on South Africa, not nearly as badly as sort of mid-century South African artists like Pirinev and Prela and Christo Kutsir and Eduardo de Villa. Um, but ultimately, there weren't many major curators and institutions that were able to look at his work and purchase his work from the 80s and early 90s. Um, only after 1994, with the new sort of democratic uh, dispensation here in South Africa, were those institutions, I don't want to say allowed to look at his work, um, but, 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 but was it more politically correct to start collecting works from South Africa? Um, so I think a lot of institutions have realized that they have major gaps when it comes to Kentridge works in the 80s and, and, and in the 90s. You know, I think San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, which has an incredible holding of, of works by William Kentridge. I'm not sure if they have any works that predate 2000. If they do, they've been acquired recently uh, and there can't be very many, but the majority of their works are from 2000 onwards. Um, and yes, they have a lot of work to choose from because of course, William is so prolific. Um, but I think a lot of those institutions uh, are looking at plugging those gaps um, and, and selecting works from the 80s and 90s. So I suppose if you're really looking for weighty, important, major works by William, certainly uh, drawings, uh, then yes, you'd be lucky to get works from, from those two decades. And where would you, I mean, where are these works now? I mean, mostly, were, were these collected by private collectors within South Africa? Were they distributed in the, the broader African region or were they, did they end up in institutional hands or private hands? Where, where, where is that sort of, I mean, I, I guess we don't entirely yeah. know, but where would you think it is? Um, you know, I think, I mean, I, I'm always rather excited to know that there are lots of major drawings around collections here in Johannesburg and in Pretoria and maybe in Cape Town, works that were acquired um, from the various exhibitions in the 1980s, often from friends and supporters of, of William, um, uh, often in the, in the Jewish community here in South Africa, who, who was a major supporter of William, certainly um, in, in, when he was starting out his career. So those major drawings are around and they do pop up occasionally. I mean, I'll never forget going down to Durban, in fact, to visit a, a lovely uh, elderly collector um, in, in a big grand home in Durban. Uh, and I was going to do evaluation and I was expecting, um, and you can never judge a book by its cover, but I was expecting sort of gentle landscapes and, and still lives. And I walked in through her front door and she had this massive William Kentridge drawing um, from Responsible Hedonism um, from 1988, 1989, which is one of the most hard hitting drawings, um, I think, produced in that decade. Um, so you can never uh, gauge where these works have got to and where they are. Um, but yes, I think some of the major galleries, of course, Goodman Gallery represents William here in Johannesburg and in London, Marianne Goodman in New York and in the US, uh, Leah Ruma in, in Italy. 
I would expect they would have occasional access to those kind of works. Mm. But yes, a very uh, a, a good number of them are already in institutions. You know, yeah. I expect William has his own archive and, and many drawings are, are kept in that archive. Uh, but many of the very famous works have already been sold and are already in major institutions and major private collections uh, around the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, just uh, coming back to his uh, drawings, uh, Alistair, you mentioned drawings from his animations or his films. Um, now, what, 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 is, what is the typical, when he makes his film, but maybe talk a little bit about how he makes his films and, and how these drawings ultimately then comes out of that, that yeah. production of that process. I mean, and are we talking about one drawing? Are we talking about hundreds of drawings? I mean, I guess he's using a sort of a stop motion type of technique, but it, it's yes. something he does it in a very particular way. So maybe you can just describe a little bit that, that process. Yes, definitely. Hold on. I'm, I'm just going to share my screen again. Um, uh, can you, is it working, Arisha? Can you see it? I'll see. Okay, something hold on. Uh, is it, can you see it now? Yeah. Um, yeah, so very good question. And there's, um, you know, a lot of people don't quite understand how a drawing like the one I'm showing you here from, from a work called Stereoscope, how it relates to the final drawing uh, hanging in a gallery or in a collection and, and the actual film. So what William does is he essentially sets his large sheets up on his studio wall and he starts drawing and working uh, with chalk typically. And then he will use a camera and photograph the progression of that drawing. Um, and he will then walk up to the drawing, he will erase it, he will add to it, um, he will walk back to the camera, keep taking photographs, uh, and he will essentially build up a stop animation film um, along those basic lines. Sometimes he will use a single sheet um, for hundreds of frames. And the work you see now on the screen, the kind of work you see hanging in a gallery is essentially the final drawing of the life of that particular sheet. Mm. Um, so that particular drawing uh, might have changed a hundred or, or 500 times. Uh, so it's very much a palimpsest. Um, it, it, it's the, um, the final version of a, of a kind of a ghostly evolving drawing that continues to develop and mutate and change. Um, and, and what you see at the end is, is just the final version of that piece. That's all stitched together um, to, to create these sort of stop animation films. Um, that, 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 that's kind of how it works. I'll try and skip through a few others to, um, to find a few more. Hold on. So, I mean, here's, a, here's another really good example um, showing the top star drive-in, which no longer exists, but very much used to be a Johannesburg landmark. But if you look at how the grass is defined um, in this sort of mind dump, uh, sort of... Uh, sort of strange landscape, you'll see it's all articulated actually through erasure. So yeah. he's using erasers and rubbers to essentially cut through um, those layers of chalk, um, which creates this amazing shimmering quality, particularly in video. Um, uh, very, very dynamic, uh, almost like the drawing is breathing, uh, as sort of, a, 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 as I say, a, a shimmering quality. Amazing. You know, and I mean, while I've, whilst I'm on these drawings, uh, this work is, uh, this drawing is from a work called Wozzeck um, from, I think, 2016. Um, but part of his drawing, part of his method is also uh, linked very much to the motifs that he works with all the time, these major metaphors, uh, specifically around the landscape. You know, for, for, for William, in my mind at least, um, the Transvaal landscape or the Heifelt landscape, the Johannesburg landscape, is really his major symbol, his major metaphor uh, for what has been going on uh, in South Africa over the last 40 years. Um, the landscape is always the setting and the scene for atrocities, for sort of lovemaking, rehabilitation, hope, protest. Um, it, it's always the landscape that's being uh, marked out, defined, uh, which is why they're always colonial overtones. Um, it's often very barren and miserable. Um, bodies are being absorbed into the landscape. Bodies are reappearing as, as, as skeletons and bones. Um, it's also, as I say, uh, the, 
the scene for major atrocities. Um, and, and as I say, feeds into the way he actually works in terms of erasing and changing these landscapes that are so often uh, scarred or ruined or in the process of being rehabilitated. You know, I think if you look at a drawing like this, yes, it's pretty damn miserable, um, but, 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 but William's work can be unbelievably beautiful too. And I think this is a, a, a fine example of that. Um, this is a drawing from about 95, 96, um, a drawing that we sold now about four or five years ago from his colonial landscape series. Um, but this is as gorgeous a drawing as I think um, you'll ever see. And yes, it's, it, it's actually perhaps a sort of filled mine dump. It could be a pool in a, in a reserve. We don't quite know. Um, we don't know if it's overgrown or naturally wild. You know, and William's always able to create these uh, amazing tensions um, in, in, in his landscape. But um, yeah, certainly not always uh, hard hitting, often just gorgeously beautiful, like, like the one I'm showing you here, which is currently hanging in a gallery slash hotel uh, in the Cape. Excellent. I mean, and just in, just in terms of um, just in terms of the, the, these drawings that we currently see, are, are they always linked to films, or, or does he also do standalone, um, you know, drawings in his own right? I mean, how, how does he work with his medium? It, it, like, it looks like many of the ones that you showed now seem to have a kind of an animation or a film aspect to it. But oh, what, what's the situation there? Yeah, so um, I mean, many, many uh, drawings are linked to films, but certainly not all of them. You know, he's produced a lot of um, other sort of standalone drawings that are, that are part of different themes. Um, you know, he, um, he's, yeah, he, he has done some, um, as I say, singular drawings that, that, that are part of broader uh, exhibitions or, or, or sets of work. If you think of um, his work more recently, certainly the big still lifes, um, the big um, ink drawings of trees, um, you know, those are part of a broad body of work, but they certainly not linked to any kind of film. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to try and find some of them for you. Um, I think I did have some to show. Yes, if, if you look at a, a, a work like this, this uh, tree, and I'm just going to find you another one here, hold on. A drawing like this, um, which is called uh, Peonies with Book on Table, you know, this is a standalone singular work. Um, it, it, it's maybe riffing of someone like Edouard Manet, um, but it's certainly not linked to any kind of a film. Um, so yes, there are many, many drawings mm. that uh, that are standalone. You know, William, to me, draws like many people speak. Uh, he, he's just a very natural draftsman. And I think there's, there's a video online um, now where he is literally drawing on the walls of the Royal Academy in London. Uh, and when you see him work like that, uh, you realize that it's just an extension of, of, of what's going on in his mind. Mm -hmm. um, so whilst many drawings are, are, are linked to the films, certainly not all of them are. I mean, the major drawing he has literally scrawled across one of the galleries at the Royal Academy uh, will be there until the middle of December, and it'll literally be then rubbed out and overpainted. Um, mm -hmm. So his drawings do have a different kind of, uh, uh, of life rather than just being linked to the films. Excellent. I mean, let's, shall we, shall we move on a little bit to maybe thinking a little bit, uh, now that we have, I think we have a great uh, background and context to, um, to his work, to the way he works, to the different periods, as you mentioned, the, the early sort of mid 1980s, uh, 1990s, and then later works. But from a um, little bit from a kind of collecting perspective, moving a little bit into the market aspect, um, I mean, we have obviously, we mentioned a little bit of the exhibitions up front and see, you know, there were more than 700 exhibitions over a, a you know, a 40 year period, um, you know, an extensive international breadth in terms of biannuals and so forth. Um, but in terms of his, this, this sort of kind of regional versus international market, I mean, if you look at purely from auction, it seems to be a relatively even split uh, between the more kind of in some of the international auction houses and, and what's happening within South Africa. Um, now, 
I guess what, what, what how how are these market different? I mean, if you look at the kind of from your perspective now, being in you know in in uh, Johannesburg and or in in South Africa, what, what, how do you see these two two different markets? Do they do they correspond? Do they uh, one act in a slightly in isolation from the other? What, what what's the situation there? Yeah, I mean, it's such a great question. Sort of, so sort of quite difficult um, to answer. Um, you know, I think first and foremost, it, it's worth just mentioning the distinction between the primary market and the secondary market. You know, yeah. The primary market being the galleries that that represent William. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the Goodman Gallery, Marianne Goodman, uh, Leah Ruma, as well as many other uh, galleries around the world. You know, these are high street. Uh, major galleries presenting exhibitions and shows, selling uh, William's work um, in that way. The secondary market uh, is essentially the, the work being sold at auction. Um, and yes, there are very few South African artists at the moment that are sold in auction rooms around the world, you know, from uh, San Francisco, you know, through New York and London and, and, and Paris, you know, all the way through uh, Johannesburg, Cape Town um, uh, to Sydney and Tokyo. Um, so, so that kind of uh, a breadth of sale room presence um, is very unusual in, in a South African context. But I think the kind of works that have been appearing uh, at auction locally, that is to say in South Africa over the last, what, 30 odd years, I mean, our... Uh, uh, um, our uh, boss, Stefan Veltz, who, who passed away a few years ago, uh, when he was with Sotheby's and, and Stefan Veltz and company in the late 80s and 90s, he was already selling William's work on auction. Hmm. So, so there's been a there's been a long legacy of William's work um, coming up on on on, on to the secondary market here in South Africa, and I suppose because of that, there's a much wider range uh, of work and range of price points. Hmm. You know, I think at some of the major major sale rooms in New York or, or London, you know, they're not going to include a Kentridge poster from an edition of 220, you know, for 300 pounds uh, in a major evening sale. Um, I mean, neither are we here in Johannesburg, but we are going to always sell those kind of works on our various platforms, whether that's a, an online sale or timed online sale. So I think the variety of work um, accessible here in South Africa is, is far wider than it maybe is internationally. Um, but one of the other major factors about Williams Market is, the, is that it's now very much a dollar linked value. Mm. And again, that's something quite unique in the South African context. You know, Williams work is thought of in dollar terms, not necessarily in South African rands. Mm. Uh, and I suppose because of that, South African collectors have had a, a, a very different attitude to buying Williams work uh, than maybe some other local artists. There's a, mm. there's a real sense of investment potential um, in Williams work um, locally. I think also you have to bear in mind the historical isolation of South Africa uh, uh, and that market. I don't just mean in terms of the cultural boycott, uh, I'm talking more practically. Mm. You know, if you were a collector, sitting in in San Francisco in the mid 1990s and you were interested in William's work and it was coming up for auction in Johannesburg or in Cape Town you probably wouldn't even know about it um, or by the time you heard about it the work would have long sold of course nowadays with with, with everything going online um, e-catalogs um, streamed auctions uh, you know the the secondary market uh, is a tiny world uh, compared to what it used to be. So access now for international buyers um, on the on the local scale here in South Africa is completely different. Mm. And I think that's also changed remarkably since the COVID pandemic, where you had all auction houses, whether it be Christie's, Sotheby's, Strauss, Phillips, uh, Bonhams, all auction houses going entirely online for at least a few months. That meant that if you wanted to bid on an auction, you had to be online. And whether you were sitting in your living room in Tokyo or in Berlin or in Chicago, uh, the kind of um, experience you were having uh, online was relatively similar across all these major auction houses. It, it also meant uh, that there was a different confidence uh, buying a work, whether it was on an auction in Johannesburg or, or, or in New York. So that has changed dramatically. I have to say that when it comes to pure value, and of course you need to take what I say with a pinch of salt, 
um, you, you simply cannot get the value uh, internationally as you can still here in South Africa. You know, we ultimately think in dollars, but we sell in South African rands. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and the work we sell across all these different price points is still considerably lower than it would be in a major gallery, for instance, um, in, in the US. To put that into context, uh, to give you specific examples, some of those early theater posters I showed you at the yep. beginning of the talk, which I really, really love, uh, we often find them, they're quite tattered, they've literally been pinned up on boards. Um, you know, we'll sell those at 20, 25, 30,000 Rand, which is about $1,500, $2,000. In a major New York gallery space, they would sell for 20 to 25,000 US dollars. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, that, that kind of uh, disparity is staggering. Uh, and I do think once the international market realizes uh, not only the quality of William's work, but, uh, but the potential um, for bargains and certainly very, very good value uh, through, uh, you know, on the local scene, you know, I think those prices will change as, as international interest increases. Do you see, um, I mean, over the last, well, during the pandemic, you mentioned the online and the digital presence, which kind of, I guess, is erasing the, um, you know, the borders in terms of having to travel, etc. Did, did you, uh, did, did Strauss and companies see a change in its collector base? I mean, well, maybe take from, with, with Kentridge, maybe specifically, um, you know, are there more international collectors now looking at these markets, you know, look, seeing the opportunities that you now just articulated? Yes, absolutely. The short answer is yes, absolutely. And, 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 you know, that's so incredibly exciting for us because in the past, as I mentioned, we have felt a little parochial, uh, you know, a, a little marginalized on that front. Uh, but, but, but certainly there's been a massive sea change with international interest over the last few years. Mm -hmm. When it comes to Williams' work specifically, I suppose we've noticed two major trends. Uh, the first being that uh, we have more and more international bidders and buyers uh, on our auctions. Um, and again, that's from across the globe. We probably send anywhere between 20 and 40% of all the Kentridges we handle uh, to overseas collectors. Mm -hmm. uh, as I say, whether it's Sydney, San Francisco, Berlin, London, um, they are being sent and shipped uh, all around the world. That is a, a, a major change. Also, I would say we've had a lot of extra interest from institutions, uh, particularly in the US. Um, a few of the major works we sold during, uh, during the pandemic uh, went to institutions in America, which was very, very exciting for us um, because that's not something that was very common um, going back five or, 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 or eight years. The other major trend is maybe more local with South African collectors, and that uh, is related to um, collectors seeing William as a as a hedge, a, a, as a strong dollar-based investment. Mm -hmm. You know, when there was so much confusion in the money market, so much uncertainty, a lot of our clients openly said to us they would rather put half a million rand into a William Kentridge than than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a, 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 a a, a significant uptick in local um, South African collectors uh, buying uh, William Kentridge with the investment uh, potential in mind. I mean, in, part of the report we produced in September was, you know, really trying to look at, the, I guess, to look at the market from a holistic point of view, looking at what we sort of define as cultural value, um, which is, you know, all the endorsement and validations from both commercial entities as well as institutions around the world. And then finally, also looking at the market, both to a certain extent primary, but losing auction, because obviously that's where most of the data is accessible. And I guess there is a, I guess the report on one way is, is, is trying to articulate the fact that there seems to be an enormous amount of, um, I will say both international and local and regional um, endorsement and validation of what he's doing. At the same time, his prices are, you know, remarkably, you know, in, in, everything is obviously relative in this world, but compared yeah. to other artists of the same standing still feel very um, reasonable. I maybe I, I, I have to be careful what I say, obviously, it goes, but, <laughs> but also, as you already mentioned, this thing of accessibility, there's very few markets where you could come in almost on a, you know, a 
fifteen hundred dollar poster and upwards. So they, they, yeah. they, it, 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 it's and I, I wonder if you feel what is actually holding this market back. I mean, if, if this was such an opportunity, why hasn't it happened yet? Or are we now? with the RA show, with the uh, Broad Museum um, having its exhibition opening in, in uh, next week um, or a few weeks, uh, are we at the cusp of, you know, the international market catching up or, 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 or what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I mean, I, 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 I hope so. And um, you know, that was one of the amazing or well, one of the many amazing findings of, of the Arctic report on, on William. Um, that yes, despite him being such a mega artist, having so many endorsements across the board, whether it's through academia or institutions or, or major uh, collectors, um, compared to the other top household names in the art world, his prices are staggeringly low. You know, I think um, you know, I, I, I think you had a statistic there where since 2016 to 2022 or something, the average price was about 29,000 US dollars. Mm. Now, if you take someone like a, a Peter Doig or someone, you know, they're not going to be averaging at 29,000 US dollars. No. Um, but I, I think maybe the statistics are not skewed, but they are um, very much affected by the large number of relatively low items that sell here in South Africa. Yeah. Um, that obviously has to, has to pull the, um, the average lot value down. Um, and I think that in itself is, is very, very revealing. Um, I also would have to make a comment on availability. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, William is enormously prolific, um, but he is, or his works are readily available. And I don't mean the drawings from the mid eighties or, 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 or the or film or drawings related to the films from the early nineties or, uh, or major collage works, the irises, the disembodied heads from the mid nineties. Those are very, very rare. But generally, if you want a Kentridge, you can phone up a hundred people um, and they'd give you various options. So I suppose the availability um, is something that is just guarding his market a little bit. Mm. Um, I mean, if I think uh, of Freeze and Freeze Masters in London two weeks ago, um, walking around there, you know, you could have bought a dozen different Kentridges, you know, whether they were tapestries, mosaics, uh, steel cutouts, drawings, major uh, wood cuts or, 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 or liner cuts. Um, you know, so I think that is a factor. Um, just guarding his market a little bit. I mean, again, in London, you know, the Goodman Gallery on Cork Street has a, a major Kentridge show on at the moment with everything naturally for sale. Um, so uh, I think that does um, have an impact on, uh, on the prices. Hmm. Um, and again, to put it into a sort of more personal context, you know, we've got an auction coming up this week. I think we have 17 Kentridges on the sale. You know, again, across all price points from 40,000 Rand all the way up to two and a half million Rand, three million Rand. Um, but, but, but yes, there's, there's never uh, an issue around uh, availability. Which, which I guess, as you, as you mentioned, is maybe something that, uh, I mean, rarity, I guess, sometimes, you know, affecting the supply, which might affect prices. At the same time, you could argue by having readily available access points it, it broadens the had the chance to broaden the audience and you will get a larger yes. collector base and you know maybe in the future um will help sustain this market and i i do yeah. believe that his work in general the way he works as you say all the way from performative and you know big big works in in public spaces all the way down to smaller you know all those things i think you know are very interesting facets of his his his, his career he doesn't do maybe the kind of typical large you know, two by two meter paintings, but there is something about his work that I think that is incredibly, um, you know, yeah. I think it's going to be important going forward. Definitely. I, I mean, you know, I think he's got many things going for him. I mean, the, the, the quality of the work and, and the breadth of concept is, is, is incredible, but he's also recognizable and yeah. familiar. You know, yeah. and I, I think that's also an important thing for an artist's market. You know, if an artist is working uh, across so many different aesthetics, uh, that you wouldn't ever be able to recognize one work from another. Um, you know, William isn't like that. Whether he's working in tapestries or, or bronze um, or performance or, or shadow play or light 
performances, puppetry, um, kinetic sculpture. It all feels and looks like William Kentridge. So I think mm. that uh, immediate recognizability uh, uh, helps. Um, also, I mean, I'll be honest, for, for years, uh, local collectors have been saying to me, how on earth does the market keep growing? Because William is so prolific. Mm. He produces so yeah. many prints, so many sculptures, so many drawings. And my answer is, is that he has a worldwide audience. Yeah. You know, if we were just selling to South Africa, we would have been in trouble a long time ago. But, um, you know, William sells around the world. You know, I always try and use the example of, of, of Rome with that triumphs and immense work. You know, that amazing mural a half a kilometer uh, uh, next to Tiber. Now, I expect many Romans would love to own a Kentridge. And yeah. if they realized that it would only cost them a thousand euro or two thousand euro, they might be inclined to buy one. And you know, if they buy one now as a thirty-year-old, you know, maybe in thirty years' time they're buying a million euro drawing. Uh, I agree. I agree. I just on, on the, as a final note, and then there might be some question. I will check uh, for anyone who has who is online and, and do have questions. We will hopefully have a, a few minutes at the end to, to try to answer that. But I want to try to maybe. Just end this conversation on maybe an aspect of his career that is not so known, at least for people outside South Africa. And that is, um, you know, William's uh, work when it comes to, you know, artist philanthropy or artist as a patron, a patron. I mean, in his, his work that is not linked to his production, but how he's actually has been integral for many, many years. Um, in terms of supporting, you know, the next generation of artists uh, with, within South Africa, can you, can you maybe talk a little bit about um, that aspect of, of him and and the output yeah. that's come out of it? Yes, uh, well, I'm, I'm so glad you you asked because this is something that's very rarely spoken of. Um, can you see? Is my am I showing my screen? Yep. You know, Williams' philanthropic power in in South Africa specifically. Um, is really incredible. And I don't think there'll ever be a chapter written on the Kentridge story uh, in terms of what he has done for hundreds of young artists, established artists, printing studios, boundaries. Uh, William um, is one of the major forces in the broad local art ecosystem. Um, he does Many of the things he does, he does so anonymously. Um, he is a genuine um, warm-hearted philanthropist in how he supports uh, the, the the local art scene. Uh, as I say, whether it's through um, bursaries or, or various fundings and printmaking studios, um, and also part of that, I suppose, is his um, very real desire to collaborate. You know, he doesn't just uh, work in isolation. He has an enormous team of robotic engineers and weavers and foundrymen and um, video um, editors. Um, he, he does so much for, 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 for the broader local scene. I'm showing you an image here of, of the Workhorse Foundry. You know, this is a bronze uh, foundry just uh, in downtown Johannesburg up the road from us here. Um, and you'll see how uh, in a picture like this, hold on, I'll just change the slide, you know, how William is working with artisans, professionals, um, and broader studios. So uh, the kind of um, influence he has on them is enormous. And I don't just mean in terms of um, aesthetic development uh, and technical um, uh, advancements, but in a real financial uh, way. You know, he is out there supporting these foundries, casting these large scale bronzes. Um, take another collaboration, his tapestries. Um, you know, William recently produced a massive, I think, six meter tapestries for the Royal Academy show, which are quite incredible. And uh, while I was in London, somebody asked me, that, does William weave all his own tapestries? And um, he, he certainly doesn't. Will, w w William can't weave, um, but he relies on this local weaving studio called the Marguerite Stevens Studio, which has a, a base in Dipslut in Johannesburg, as well as in Swaziland. Um, and, you know, all the wool is, it, it is farmed in the Eastern Cape when the Karoo, it's sent uh, to Swaziland where it's spun and carded and dyed. Um, and then this amazing group of artisans 
um, these uh, the, the, these women, um, both locally or in Johannesburg and in Swaziland, actually go ahead and execute William's large scale tapestry designs. Uh, so the support uh, William gives just on that front in terms of that kind of um, artistic uh, collaboration is amazing. Um, I've mentioned printing studios. Whilst William is a master printmaker of that, there is no doubt he still works with so many local studios. Uh, on the left is Kim Berman, um, the director of the Artist Proof Studios here in Johannesburg. Gillian uh, Ross with David Crutt. You'll see her working with Williams Prince and William kind of in the background tinkering uh, on what's going on. Um, Mark Atwood, um, I expect the best lithographic printmaker in South Africa uh, based on his amazing sort of off-grid, fully sustainable farm near White River. Um, you know, William collaborates with Mark all the time. Um, again, to give you the extent of his influence, you know, I happen to know a, a barefoot farrier, a horse farrier who's based in, in, in North Yorkshire, who still produces some of the uh, sort of leather bound sleeves that William uses for his, um, for his fold up works like the one I'm showing you here. Similarly, uh, this is Simon Atwood, who is uh, Mark Atwood's son, a brilliant artist in his own right. But Simon Atwood happens to make chalk, uh, not any chalk, the only chalk that William Kentridge uses. Um, and again, that's another little example of the reach that William has. And you can, in fact, buy some of um, Simon Atwood's sort of homemade chalk uh, at the Royal Academy shop right now. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, Alistair, well, thank you very much for uh, such, such, uh, I've just been sitting here and just absorbing your passion and your knowledge about this thing. And it's been absolutely incredible. There are a few questions and, and I, 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 we have, I don't know, are we limited to one hour or because then we've gone a little bit above, but uh, should we take five minutes trying to address at least some of them? Yeah, definitely. Well, and before we take some of the questions, I mean, from our side, you know, we just like to say how enormously grateful we are um, uh, that Art Tactic, you know, has produced this amazing report on William. I mean, it's taught us so much. Um, and also it's given an amazing endorsement for the Kentridge market. You know, it is so in-depth. There hasn't been anything like it ever on a South African artist. You know, so to have that kind of endorsement and that kind of insight is so amazing for us as an auction house, but also for all our clients and Kentridge collectors. So thank you. No, fantastic. And we will we will continue. I think, you know, for us, it's exciting to find, uh, you know, our, how we can use our research most effectively. And, and partly, I would say most all of our research is, is sits in the educational space. It's not there to tell you to buy or not to buy. It's trying to give a holistic and 360 view of the market so people can navigate and be more informed about at least the market segment. But I think this sort of this juxtaposition and this kind of combination here of local knowledge, knowledge about the artist together with information that I think hopefully is something that will you know, bring more maybe people into this uh, incredibly exciting space that we, we had talked about today. So um, thanks thanks to you as well. And thanks to Strauss and company for, for um, you know, for working with us on this. So um, brilliant. So, uh, the first question is, um, uh, Kentridge's work also it has a kind of a tendency that the, the drawings has a kind of usually a hint of red. There might be red lines. There might be you no. Know, why is that? W what does this red symbolize uh, in yeah. his works? Is what he what, what the, the question comes from? Yeah, yeah, good, good, good question. I mean, I, I don't think I have a very good answer for it. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, William generally works in black and white and grey. You know, it, 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 it's a monotone kind of aesthetic. Um, the most colorful William was, was early in his career, sort of the mid 1980s, where he included some, you know, ranges of pink and some greens and everything, just little hints of color in his drawings. And that kind of drained away. Uh, in many ways, I think as the work got more important and more weighty, um, certainly when it came to the films, but he does use red to highlight things. You know, I showed you that uh, really lovely colonial landscape with those red lines through it. You know, I think if you think of what the red is doing in a work like that, um, it's talking about the idea of demarcation and defining landscapes in a 
post-colonial way. You know, the idea of uh, colonial powers kind of chopping up the landscape and measuring it out and defining it. You know, I think he makes that point very strongly with those red elements. I think had they been in a different color, uh, mm -hmm. you might not have noticed it. Um, he uses a lot of blue, um, particularly early on in his works. And again, it's mainly uh, used for water, you know, depicting water. And again, that's a, a very strong symbol for William's work. You know, these pools, these stagnant pools being a symbol for uh, a political moment, uh, but also tears, the, the, these tears sort of streaming from figures' uh, eyes, you know, whether those are tears of guilt or, or, or tears of terror or tears of sadness. You know, I think they are just um, the color, the flashes of color, the red and the blue are maybe just ways to emphasize those kind of points. Mm. Um, but no, generally, it, there's not too much color in, in the drawings. However, if you are ever part of, of his big sort of processional works, or his uh, you know, major sort of all-encompassing exhibitions that have sound and light and shadow um, and movement. Those are some of the most colorful, animated environments you could ever be in. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so much going on. Um, and, and many of the films uh, and operas, certainly more recently, if I think of Sybil, for instance, they are filled with, 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 with color, but yes, early on and particularly the drawings in the 90s, yeah. pretty much black and white shades of gray with hints of color. There's a kind of a related uh, question from uh, Stefan, uh, which is comes to the color or lack of color, as he say, you know, and, and often maybe a kind of a, a slightly, if not negative narrative, um, you know, may, maybe in, in terms of the difficulties, I mean, creating that these subject matters might be tough for collectors. And he says, sort of saying, is there a link between his cap on his prices versus all sort of kind of other mega artists uh, that we see out there that the subject matter itself is or can be too too difficult, too, comp too yeah. hard for, for audiences? What, what What's your uh, opinion on that? Well, I think that's a brilliant point. And I think you can't deny the fact that some collectors aren't interested in whether a work is important or not. They yeah. want to work that is gorgeous and is pretty and they love looking at every day. Yeah. And yes, many of William's drawings, particularly the, 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 the meaty political ones, are hard hitting and many people don't want them above their fireplaces. Um, you know, they, they would prefer a David Hockney of North Yorkshire or something with all those wonderful colours. Um, so, yes, I think that does have an impact on his market. And I can give you a little bit of local insight which is that there have been lots of stories uh, and conversations that I've been part of where local collectors have come up to us and said, well, I really, really love that landscape, but if I buy it, can William paint it with more green? You know, we have to say, well, sorry, no, William, <laughs> William doesn't really do that. Um, but, but, but that is a very good point. And if I think about the very, very popular works, um, the, the, the irises, for instance, with that wonderful purple lilac kind of wash in the background um, and, and the gouache uh, large scale works he did of flowers, um, as well as those disembodied heads, you know, they have a lot of color, you know, whether they are purples or oranges or yellows or reds. And, and the truth of, it, uh, truth of it is that, yes, they do sell better. If we have a big, colorful, pretty Kentridge, we're always much more confident of selling something like that, uh, particularly to a private collector um, than, than we are with a sort of hard hitting political landscape. So yes, absolutely, it's a, it's a very, very good point. Perfect. Well, I think with two more questions, and I guess then people have been very patient with us and well, not, I think probably had, people have enjoyed this very much, but um, I want to have a, a, a quick question regarding uh, we talked about the international reach that um, that that Kentridge has re achieved, and I, uh, there's a question from Eileen uh, regarding how did he manage to, to do this? How did he succeed to reach out to this international audience? Was this through a co collaboration by his galleries, and particularly again foreign galleries? How, how, how did this happen? Yeah. Um, again, very good question. Uh, the million dollar question for so many uh, sort of contemporary artists. And I think it's a combination of all those things you mentioned. You know, I think William has a brilliant gallery behind him. 
you know, the Goodman Gallery does a phenomenal job with William um, in terms of promoting him, making sure his work uh, is exhibited widely, goes to major, uh, major institutions, is always available and visible at major art fairs. Um, and it's not just uh, the Goodman Gallery, it's also Marian Goodman in the US, um, Lia Ruma, uh, the Italian uh, representative, they do an amazing job for William. You know, William has a powerful or have powerful galleries behind him. But you, you also can't deny that academics, um, art historians, critics um, have always taken a very serious interest in William's work. You know, mm -hmm. so if there is a major uh, show, um, it, 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 you know, in a U.S. city, you know, major critics will go and have a look at it and they'll think very seriously about it and they will give their honest views. And those kind of views and opinions and reviews will make all the major daily broadsheets and newspapers and, uh, and magazines. So, um, you know, I think he ticks all the boxes in terms of academic endorsement, um, curatorial endorsement, uh, works that are readily on show at major institutions, major auction houses around the world, and in major uh, gallery hotspots. So um, all of that is very, very important. You know, I think the fact that William deals with um, serious issues um, has also helped the, uh, the, the spread of his work, you know, because academic institutions are interested in dealing with uh, meaty concepts. Also, if you think of the relatively recent interest in colonialism and post-colonialist uh, colonialist thought, the idea of the body, um, the idea of um, uh, politics, the transition in political regimes, you know, these are all uh, major themes that academics are dealing with around the world. And William is very much part of that dialogue and conversation. You know, he is dealing with those very, very um, hefty topics all the time. Excellent answer. I think we probably will we'll round off here. Uh, I guess so if people do have a question, I guess they can reach out to, out to you or me, either through yep. our websites. Um, yeah, your sale, uh, with the, you mentioned that there was a number of Kentridge works coming up. That's uh, that's next week, right? Yeah, so we uh, we um, we have five or six sales over the next uh, week or so, uh, starting off tomorrow night, Thursday night. Um, and then we have uh, major auctions next uh, Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. They all uh, stream live through our website. You can view all the catalogs, the e-catalogs, uh, read all the catalog notes. Um, and yes, everything is available on our website, which is straussart.co.za. Um, and yes, we are very, oh, as you can probably tell, I enjoy talking. So if there are any questions, uh, people can always ring us up or email us directly. Um, yeah, we, we, we would love to chat about William and any other uh, work coming up for sale. Fantastic. And from our side, uh, for those of you who are interested in, um, in the Kentridge Report, we have a special offer together with um, which draws is 30% off the report, which you also can go on to the website. There's a coupon there that you can use. Um, but Alistair, I would just like to thank you for your, again, for your in, in, in knowledge, expertise and incredible enthusiasm and, and sharing that with us. I think it's just been incredible and hope we can do similar things on, you know, other artists in the future. Um, and I hope also the audiences that have been patient with us for the last uh, hour and a quarter really also enjoyed this, this journey. Um, yeah, brilliant. So, thank you so much, Anders. Thank you. And thank you to everybody for listening. Fantastic. Take care. Okay, have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.